Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Murder, Bacon a Mystery, a Bam, Bam, Bam. Okay, that was weird. <laughs> that was a weird intro. Are you wondering what I'm wondering? Yes, visually, if you're watching this on YouTube, I am about to cook a whole meal, a whole mochi, multiple different flavors in this room. Is it gonna be a mess? Maybe am I gonna have an ant problem? Absolutely, but I do this for you. <laughs> okay, so today we're gonna be making something that I saw called melona mochi. Melona is a Korean ice cream that tastes like cantaloupe, tastes like melons, tastes like bananas, strawberries, and you make it into a wonderfully doughy, chewy mochi. I'm excited. But first, I have a really important question to ask you. We're eating this mochi together, but who are you sleeping with? Or more in particular, what are you sleeping with? Listen, I'm not gonna shame you, but maybe I will if you're not sleeping on a Helix mattress because it's honestly the no-brainer for sleep. For the longest time, I wanna say for like a year and a half, I was going through this phase where I was like, you know what, I'm just getting old. That's the reason that every single morning I wake up, I am sore. I am just feeling like this shoulder pain. I don't feel like I slept for eight hours. What's going on? And I just kept convincing myself, Stephanie, it's you're getting old. That's what happens when people get old. And I decided, you know what, maybe I should try swapping out my mattress. It's got stains on. On it. I don't know where those stains are from. So I, I went on to Helix and I took this really, really quick, like two minute quiz because everybody sleeps differently. I'm a side sleeper. He sleeps hot, I sleep cold. So we took this quiz together and it matched us with the Helix Midnight Lux mattress. Came to us, shipped to our door, we opened it up and laid our bodies on that night and I regret not getting it sooner. Whether you guys like a soft, medium, or firm mattress, whether you're a side, back, stomach sleeper, or they even have plus size mattresses for plus size folks, they've got the whole array. The Midnight Lux mattress, the one that I got matched with, it's honestly amazing because it's this medium firmness. I no longer have that shoulder and hip pain. It just melts my body into it and just hugs me in this warm embrace. And they have over 12,000 five star reviews. They were also rated 2020's number one over overall mattress in GQ and Wired Magazine, so I'm not the only one that's obsessed with Helix. They have a 10 year warranty and you're thinking, well, Steph, I gotta try it out. You can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. You don't like it? They'll come pick it up for you. And Helix is offering you guys up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to you guys if you go to helixsleep.com slash baking. That's helixsleep.com slash baking for up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Thank you, Helix, for sponsoring today's video and let's get into it. So I'm gonna start telling you the story while I open up the Malona ice creams. Sorry, I'm like narrating what I'm doing because of the audio listeners and we're gonna put them into these bowls and let them melt naturally. I might stick them in my pants just to get the heat going. We'll see. That's a method. <laughs> so we've got coconut, melon, strawberry, mango, and banana. So we've got the ice creams opened. We have a coconut. I think this one's gonna look like a regular mochi because it's pretty white in color. I know, this is a sin. We're letting ice cream just melt right in front of our faces. A strawberry. This one looks so pretty. The melon melona. This is my fave. I used to hate it growing up because it's not the sweetest ice cream. And then we've got mango. And then we have banana, let's oh, see. They're so colorful. So we've got green, pink, orange, yellow, and white. <gasps> so cute, look at this. The ice cream are chilling, they're melting. We're just gonna let it sit for like 10 minutes. I mean, you're supposed to let it fully melt. So maybe I'll do some of this action. Maybe it helps, I have no idea. So the movie that we're talking about today is a Spanish thriller, which by the way, I think that this might be the last band before we move. Hold on to your tits, because when we move, there's gonna be a whole change. There's gonna be a whole revamp, a relaunch of bands. I'm really excited, you have no idea, but I can't tell you all my secrets yet. My hair is full of them. My hair is full of secrets, okay? <laughs> so this might be the last one, and it's maybe we're gonna be doing a book after this one. It's called The Secret in Their Eyes. Yes, it's a Spanish thriller. Yes, is there an that's American- a movie today. Yeah, there's a movie today. There is an American remake, which is rated so horrendously. So I went ahead and I watched the OG, okay? I watched the Spanish film, and I am intrigued. I'm gonna tell you the story, and you tell me how you feel, right? And what would you do if you were in this situation? It's one of those movies. Like, would you do this? If 
if you were in this situation? Kind of that question. So it starts with two different people. We've got a retired criminal detective by the name of Benjamin. Now he's retired from his job, was a great investigator it seems, and he's writing this novel about a case that he tried working on 20 plus years ago. Like 25 years ago, really. And it was the brutal assault and murder of a young 23 year old woman who was murdered in her own room, like her own house. She was a newlywed, she was a school teacher. I mean, how could this happen? And we've got Judge Irene, which is kind of like the prosecutor at the time. So she was working with Benjamin for most of their careers. And it's got a little bit of like this, do they love each other? Do they not love each other? What's going on? Like, are they gonna kiss? I don't know, right? Like they're talking about murder, but like, I'm like, are they gonna kiss? It's kind of gotten like a K-drama vibe to it. <laughs> <laughs> so he starts writing this book and the movie is told in these little sequences. We get a flashback to the past and then we have Judge Irene reviewing his novel, like reading it and she'll make some commentary on it and then kind of guide him into, this is like um, him writing the novel. Like that's the whole process of this movie. She'll tell him, well, what scene are you gonna put next? Like what part of the story is next? And then we get another flashback and then some more commentary, right? And it gets a little bit wild. So let's start with the flashback from 25 years ago. Young Benjamin working in that office. Does he look a little bit naive? Yes. Does he have a full head of non-gray hair? Absolutely. And in walks in prosecutor DA Irene. She's not a judge yet and she is a Cornell graduated just from a wealthy family, beautiful, well-educated, rich, wealthy, dating an engineer, a prominent engineer. And of course, Benjamin's in love. Benjamin's like, she's way out of my league, but I, I love her so much. But he can't even talk to her. Like, he just freezes up. Can't even just smooth talk his way into, you know? A lot of K-pop references right now, Why? <laughs> you know, can't even like smooth talk his way into it. And so they start working together and in comes the Morales case, which is the whole movie. The judge is like, listen, you've got a new case. It's on your table. And he's a little bit upset. What do you mean? That guy's supposed to get it. Let's call him Jonathan, you know? Jonathan is the other criminal detective. It's his turn to get the case. I just finished a case. Like I, I had to do paperwork. No, you're getting the case today. So he's a little bit upset and you just, as a viewer, you're like, what the heck? I mean, I would never, that's like the, the whole tweet about what if I'm the, the episode on investigation discovery that some bitch forwards, she's like, this one's boring. <laughs> It's like your murder, you know? And so he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll take the case. He rushes to the crime scene and almost immediately the vibe changes, okay? Because when he walks in, he sees the dead body of Liliana. Now she is 23, she's a school teacher. This is in her house. There's no signs of a break-in. Maybe it was someone that she knew. There's pictures of her and her newlywed husband all over the place. His name is Ricardo and he works at the bank. So, I mean, this is like every woman's worst nightmare. So he's a little bit shaken up about this and he starts taking this case incredibly seriously. Thank God, from the get-go, he goes to Ricardo at work and has to inform him that his wife has been brutally murdered. And this guy, I mean, I was a little bit suspicious of him, okay? Because it's always the husband. But he seemed so genuine. He just was so distraught. He said, there's nobody that would have the key to our place. There's nobody that's been stalking us. We don't have any enemies, I don't understand. So he's like, it's okay, I'm gonna solve this case for you. And he rushes back to the office to get his work started when Jonathan, the other criminal investigator, in front of the boss, makes a whole scene. He says, you know what, Benjamin? You, you were too lazy to take this case. You don't want this case, oh, I don't want more work, you know, no, 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 no. That's what you said, right? You're welcome, I solved it for you. I uh, got two guys in jail, they confessed to it. Two construction workers, yeah. They were working in the building. They raped her, they murdered her, and now they're in jail. And the judge is like, wow, good work, Jonathan. The boss is like, wow, you didn't even have to do that. That was Benjamin's case, but good for you. Just like a whole nine yards pat on the back. And Benjamin's pissed, okay? So he goes to the prison. He wants to question them. Why would you do such a thing? What is wrong with you? What kind of evil monsters are you? And when he opens that prison door, he looks at one of the two construction men and he immediately runs back to the office and decks Jonathan in the face. Can you guess why? Can you guess why? He's beaten. Yeah. The, the guy that was in prison, I mean, his whole eye was stitched up. His lips were stitched up. Like, it was bad. He was badly beaten. So this prosecutor, this criminal investigator, had beat the confession out of him. Which means this is a false confession. Like, you just put two nobodies into prison just because what? 
they they don't have these like high jobs they don't have credibility because they're uh, quote unquote construction workers like big deal right and he's like i'm gonna file a complaint meanwhile jonathan's on the ground at the courthouse like yelling racial slurs against the two guys that are in prison just like really insensitive slurs what? right yeah and so he's like i'm gonna file a complaint so at this point the judge has to move jonathan to a completely new jurisdiction he does not get fired which is wild right but he gets moved to a different jurisdiction and benjamin is still working on this case so that night he's trying to work in his office but he can't stop thinking and he just rushes to ricardo's place and knocks on the door now this is the husband of the woman liliana who's murdered and they start going over these old photo albums of liliana first of all ricardo super sweet husband like he took so many wonderful pictures of her like kept them all just seemed really considerate right so they're passing through the pages and she's truly so beautiful and he keeps saying when you catch this guy, what's going to happen to him? Well, for murder, he's going to get life. And we don't have the death penalty, so he'll just get life in prison. Is that okay? And Ricardo's like, yeah, yeah, I don't like the death penalty. And Benjamin's thinking, well, I mean, I, I know most people don't unless it's their loved one that gets murdered. Then suddenly, you know, you might have different ideas about the death penalty. No, I don't like it. Because what? He gets injected with something and he takes a very long nap. I wouldn't mind getting injected with something and taking a very long nap. I'd rather him rot in prison for life. That's what I want. I want him to sit there and think about what he did for life. So Benjamin's like, yeah, um, makes sense. And he's scrolling through these photo books, just flipping page by page, and he notices something. Ricardo, who is this man right here? Oh, I don't know. Some of these pictures are from before I even met her. Here, I have, um, we have like a numbering system. system. I taught her this, so I can look up his name in the photo book. And so he's going through, and all of the pictures, you see him on the side just kind of staring at her. It seems like they do know each other. It's not a stalker that's just hiding behind trees. He is part of the picture, but he's just staring at her in every picture. He's not looking into the camera. He's not looking at anybody else. Just always in the back, staring at Liliana. So he's like, who the hell is this guy, right? Does she have any brothers? Is that a brother that might like, like hate her or something? What's going on? And Ricardo says, oh, I think it's a friend from home, her hometown. His name is Ian Gomez. I, it's His name is Isidoro, Isidoro in the movie, but I'm going to call him Ian because I'm going to butcher it every time, right? So he's like, it's Ian Gomez. And now Benjamin's whole thing about this, being a crime detective, he says that the eyes are very strange. The eyes tell you things. And the way that Ian was looking at her was not like your stereotypical, oh my God, I'm going to kill you. Like I'm a little stuck or like I'm stalking you with those beady psychopathic eyes that you would expect in like the movie you know the shining when he like sticks his head in and he's like looking side to side not like that but his eyes almost were looking at her as if he was worshiping her which is even more bizarre like just super strange like got these really obsessive eyes right so he keeps focusing on this Ian person and he says oh well that's interesting I'll look into it don't worry about it Ricardo I'm gonna solve this for you and he leaves but does Ricardo let it go so now that we've melted it, I'm just gonna add in some gluttonous rice powder to each one of them and make it into like a thick consistency. Then we're gonna need to microwave it. You're gonna wanna mix it really well. So what does Ricardo do? Does Ricardo, this loving husband, just leave it up to the detective to solve this case? Absolutely not. Would you? No. He looks up Ian's phone number in a directory. Yeah. Do you want me to do it? No, that's okay. I got it. I can mix, you know? Uh. Oh, shit. <laughs> you can make The it minute off. that I say that, I get flour everywhere. You are distracting me, sir. You're just stop taking off your clothes over there in the corner. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, so does Ricardo just leave it up to the detective? No, he decides that he is going to look into a directory and call Ian's house number. And when he does, Ian's mom picks up. And he says that Ian has moved into the city, which is the same city that they live in about a month ago. So this matches the timeline, okay? Everything about this matches. And so he pretends that he's just a job offering, like, oh, uh, I was just trying to see his address because we're trying to give him a job. And the mom's like, oh, that's weird. Did he happen to know a Liliana? And she says, "Yeah, why are you asking that? They used to um they used to date when she lived here. They they're from the same hometown." And he says, "Oh, um because Liliana is the one that offered him the job, is referring him to the job." I mean, he lied. He doesn't want to let Ian know that they're on to them. 
and he's crying. It's a really emotional scene. And so Who's the mom, crying? Robert or uh, Ricardo. While they're on the phone with mom. Yeah, like he's trying to like fix his voice, but he's not crying, you know. But you can see that he's like about to sob. Because he's pretending like Liliana is the one that referred him this job. When in reality, Liliana's been murdered. Mm, so, it. you know, and she's like, oh, well, he'll be so happy to hear that. He really likes her. So he just hangs up the phone and he starts freaking out. Now, Benjamin, the detective, on the other hand, he too wants to catch this guy. But he can't seem to get an address. He knows that he's working at some construction site. So they go from construction site to construction site. And when they finally get to the right one, they said that something peculiar happened. The other night, he gets a phone call. And he just leaves in the middle of the night. I mean, literally, we owed him like a week's worth of pay. Is that not crazy? Most people will stand at our door, demand our pay. But he just packed up all of his stuff from the hostel. And he left. A little strange, don't you think? Suspicious. So they keep looking for him. Eventually, Benjamin and his assistant by the name of Pablo, who is um, a really nice old man but spends most of his time drinking at the local bars, he, they decide that they're going to stalk Ian's mom. They find her. They break into her house. And they try to look for anything of where he could be right now because Ian is a bit of a mama's boy. There's no way that no matter where he is, a motel, a hostel, a different country, he would have written letters to the mom. And it seems like the mom knows what's going on because they find a stack of letters, but she threw out all the envelopes. So they have no address. They have no return address. Nothing. So they start panicking. She comes in right as they're about to leave the place. It's like this whole sh show. Wow, some consistencies are very different. Like this banana one's quite different from the other one. It's a little clumpier maybe. So, um, you know, it's a whole sh show. They grab the letters. It's like 17 letters and they leave. Now when they get to work, their boss is waiting for them. Y you know what's funny? Ben, you know what's funny? Funny, Ben. I just got a call from another jurisdiction saying that this old poor lady's house got broken into and they found a very suspicious vehicle parked on the side of the street. They ran the plates and get, can you guess? Starts with a B, ends with a, I'm about to fire your ass. You know, do you know anyone like that? The license plate number is this. And he's like, okay, uh, yeah, it was us. So he confesses to it and he says, what, what is your problem? Why are you breaking into an old woman's house? For what? Because he's in some pictures with the victim? Like that doesn't, that's not probable cause that you can't even get a search warrant for something like that, which is obviously why you broke into the woman's house. Don't ever do that again. And he gets left off on a warning and Irene calls him into her office. Thankfully for Irene, she was able to smooth talk the other jurisdiction and get the charges lifted. They're not going to arrest Benjamin. They're also not going to fire him, but the case is officially closed. Closed? Who's the myth? Bazaar. Who's the killer? They don't know. They're just going to close it. Yeah, love that police can just do that, you know? They're just like, you know what? We decide that we're closing it because we can't solve it. So there we go. So they close the freaking case. We microwave to the mochi for two minutes, mixing in between. Now we're just going to put a little bit of oil onto our clean little board so that we can knead it on there really well. Did you tell them what you're making? Uh, yeah, melona mochi. A mochi. A mochi. I'm making a melona mochi. It's hot, huh? Yeah. Very hot. Oh my god. Oh my god. I keep burning myself and I keep going in to grab it again. Like it's kind of the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> like when will she learn? We don't know. But I feel like for stuff like this, time is of the essence, no? Yeah. So let me get this one a little oily. Okay. I just imagine like the people listening to the audio, like in the car, and you just hear, oh, like, what are you listening to? Okay, okay. Now I got the strawberry in there. You're just going to kind of knee it into a ball. I mean, it's already a very, very... I think they do like, the fold, like folding, folding stuff okay, to make it round. No, no, like kind of pull the thing into middle yeah, to Yeah, okay. Round. My fingers are getting first degree burns right now. <laughs> and you're just backseat driving this mochi to town. <laughs> So about a year passes and Benjamin is busy working on other cases because, you know, it happens. He's got a million other things to do when he walks through a very busy train station and he happens to run into Ricardo and he's saying, oh, Ricardo, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Just sitting here. Are you waiting for someone? And so Ricardo tells him that he has been waiting at this train station and all the other busy ones in this area for the past year, every single day, 
after work because if this Ian guy is living in this city, if he's anywhere near this city, he would probably have to use one of these as transportation, right? And he's he's telling Benjamin all of this as if this doesn't sound crazy, like as if this doesn't sound sad or like, oh my God, what do we do, right? Which honestly, no one's like shading him for not moving on, right? This is traumatic. And Benjamin looks guilty because this case has been closed and he hasn't been searching for Ian. He hasn't been searching for anyone. Now I'm just gonna pull apart these nice, juicy, I'm so nervous, round little, I have made some inappropriate things. <laughs> nice little, round, juicy mochis. Oof, that's pretty cute. It looks kinda cute, oh, that's no? Good. You yeah, want me to check more? Beautiful. Wow. 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 So Benjamin runs back to the office and he goes up to Judge Irene and he says, listen, I need you to do me a huge favor. I have never seen anyone in love like this. I have never seen pure, unadulterated, just pure straight up love and devotion like I've seen on Ricardo. I've worked so many cases, so many family members, so many spouses get murdered or get killed or disappeared and I have never seen love like this and he deserves answers. And so what does Judge Irene do? She secretly low-key loves Benjamin, but she's engaged to a very world-renowned engineer. She says, okay, fine, open up the case again. Open up the safe, that's what they do. So now Benjamin and Pablo, his assistant, start going over those letters that they stole from Ian's mom's house, and they realize something, something very strange, right? And Pablo realizes this, This the assistant. He says, there's things that you can change in a man. You can change his work, you can change the way he lives, you can change his girlfriend, you can change the way he dresses, but there are certain things that you can't change. Passion. My passion is drinking at bars after work, okay? That's my passion. No matter where I go, I'm not gonna stop doing this because that's my passion. And read these letters. They have numbers, they have names. We kept looking up, you know, criminal records of all these people, but maybe it's not his friends. It's soccer. All the numbers and all the people reference major soccer players. We just gotta go look for him in the stands. So they go to all these massive soccer matches. They spend four matches just looking through the crowds, looking for this Ian person. And sure enough, they do not find him because imagine trying to even look for your spouse in one of these arenas. It's nearly impossible. So at the fourth place, you know, it's, it's about time. Benjamin's ready to give up when right as they're about to score a goal, they spot Ian. And they try to grab at him, but of course he makes a run for it. The crowd erupts into cheers because their team just scored a goal and there's just chaos. They're running after him, chasing after him. He's jumping through bleachers. He's jumping through the back ways. They're chasing him. By the way, Benjamin and Pablo are not that fit. So it's a little bit strugglesome to chase after him. And somehow the police, like a major police force gets involved and Ian decides the only way to escape is to run out into the field, which is like the dumbest thing ever. Because if you think that the police are chasing after you, try running onto the court of like an NBA game. You're gonna get tackled and arrested and just probably put in prison for the rest of your life. You're gonna get treated as a worse criminal than an R-worder. That's how intense that they take these sports. So he gets tackled by the police that are waiting. Look at how cute these are. And they arrest the mother forker. Now, once he's arrested, Benjamin has a super illegal plan. His whole plan is that he's gonna question Ian without any attorneys present. Judge Irene does not approve of this. She thinks that this is the stupidest thing that he could possibly do. You're gonna try to coerce a confession out of this guy without an attorney present? Are you kidding me? She gets pissed off, but he says he has to do it. This guy is gonna lie. This guy's gonna come up with all these excuses. It's been a year. They need to have a confession. That's the only way it's gonna work. This one is a, a very strange, still quite liquidy consistency. Oh no. <laughs> Judge Irene does not approve of his questioning, but instead Benjamin goes ahead, brings him into the office, and starts questioning him. I know you did it, you crazy mother you creepy little mother forker. Why did you leave that hostel? Why did you change these jobs? Why were you in these pictures looking like an absolute creep? And of course well, on, this guy. Is this one sticky? Yeah, I think all of them are it. undercooked. Oil me up, baby. <laughs> Oil me up, okay? 
So he brings in Ian to be questioned. Now Ian is playing that role of just like this nerdy boy who has no idea what's going on. What am I arrested for? <gasps> She's been murdered, that's crazy. I didn't know anything about it. I've just been working. I've just been doing my thing. We used to like each other, you know, but that doesn't mean I murdered her. And Benjamin's pissed off by this. He's like, yes, you freaking did. If you, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you didn't, why would you change hostels? You know, we, ch we went to that place and they said that you moved out super quickly. If you didn't, why would you leave that construction job without getting a week's pay? Why would you do all of these very suspicious things if you didn't murder her? Admit it, you murdered her. And the whole time he's like, what are you talking about? I just couldn't afford the hostel anymore, so I left. What are you talking about? I got a better construction job that was paying me so much more that I didn't even need to stay around for that extra weeks of worth's pay, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, Judge Irene comes in and she's a little bit pissed off. Like she told Benjamin not to be asking Ian all these questions without an attorney. And she leans over to whisper in Benjamin's ear, like you better not freaking do this. You know, they're gonna come, they're gonna fire us. And she looks over at Ian and he is staring like a psychopath into her like shirt, you know, because when you lean over, your shirt kind of falls open a little bit. <laughs> and she looks at him and he looks at her and he does not look like that sweet little nerdy, harmless, I'm not like other boys, boys anymore. He's got this nasty look on his face. So she says, you know what, Benjamin? There's no point in questioning him because he didn't do it. What? What? So of course Benjamin's like, what are you talking about? And Ian's like, see, she knows I didn't do it. There's no way that he could have done it. Think about it. You're a crime detective. Think about it. There's no way. I mean, let's look at these autopsy pictures, right? She scrolls around into the files, finds the autopsy pictures. She was brutally assaulted. This guy, I mean, look at his arms. They're noodles. We're looking for someone who has upper body strength. This one's not it, he's got noodle arms. And Ian looks a little bit pissed, but like, okay, yeah, I didn't do it. And besides, remember the, the report, and now Benjamin's catching on. You know, she says, besides, the report said that the intruder was let in. You think that this beautiful girl, Liliana, knows this You think she's gonna let in this ugly guy? No, she would only let in a real man. Hot to go. <laughs> It's the hottest oh, thing. Cute. Can I get a little more oil? Okay, I'm gonna have to speed through these real quick. Okay. It's really hard to tell a story and make these mochis. Oh, it's not easy to be a mochi master, huh? No. No wonder mochis are so pricey. Yeah. Oh yeah, pound it. Look at that. That looks really good. Oh, I'm really yeah. excited. Each of these is one ice cream bar. Are you ready? Which one do you want to try? Um, I want to try it all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but like you don't want to have a preference. Should we start with the OG? Yeah. Okay, let's start with the melon. <laughs> What's that face? No, it's so good. I think it just needed a little more oil on the outside. Mmm. Mmm. It's so light mm. in sweetness. Just like how you would get authentic mochi, it's not really sweet if you get authentic mochi. It's like just enough sweetness. This is good. This is not like a fake mm. mochi, it's like a real mochi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. mm. The strawberry is my favorite. Wow. Mm. Wow. Okay. The banana. Oh my god, I'm blown away. Whoa. Whoa. That was That's gnarly. so good. Mm -hmm. The coconut. So far, I like the strawberry, the melon, then the banana. Mm. Mm. I think you'll love coconut. It's toasty. Best for last, mango. Oh, this one's good. I am so impressed. Wow. And I think if, cause mochi can be really expensive. If you're home, you've got a dinner party, just make these, no? Mm -hmm. And the different colors, the softness, the slightly sweetness, so good. What's the recipe? You saw it on TikTok, right? Yeah. I'm gonna link the person who made the recipe. They, I think it's a YouTube channel, so. But it's going viral on TikTok. 
So good. Let's get into the story. And Judge Irene keeps going, even gets up into his face and grabs his little cheeks like a little boy. And is like, yeah, I mean, definitely not this guy. Think about it. Let's say she was having an affair. That's why she opened the door to a strange man. It's got to be someone with some dark hair, broad shoulders. Not this little boy. Not this boy that makes mushy faces into the camera. You think it's this boy? Detective, you're usually good at this, but I'm telling you, you're wrong on this one. And she keeps going and she goes over the autopsy reports and she says that there was substantial damage to her private area. I mean, that means that the perpetrator's got to be somewhat well endowed. You can't be comparing sausages to peanuts. And right here, we've got peanuts. <laughs> so I suggest we go back to the last person that we interrogated because he seems more than man enough. This guy, this one's a boy. And he gets up. Ian's red in the face. And this is where I was like, oh my god. He just uh, whips it out. He what? whips out his wee-wee. He stands up and says, I'm not man enough. And we see it. The viewer sees the wee-wee. He whips it out. The wee-wee's in frame. And he says, you like that? I'm man enough. And she says, first of all, little boy, you'll never reach the pinata. It's too short. And second of all, you're not man enough for a woman like me. And he gets so pissed. Not man enough, you effing B-I-D-Z-H, and punches her in the face and keeps screaming, I... I forked the shit out of her. I forked the shit out of her. I forked her brains out like I was so good at it. Just screaming about how he R-worded Liliana. He confessed. He confessed, and he was pissed. And he punches Irene in the face. So they, you know, they detain him. This is the confession. A lot of other people were there to witness this whole scene of his, his whipping out his eggplant. All of that. And he gets put in prison. She's really good. Yeah. She knows what triggers him, right? Yeah. She, like, really knows how to trigger these people to get them into confessing. And on top of that, he gets arrested. Now, here's where the story gets crazy. After a year in prison, he gets released. He gets released. He was supposed to spend life in prison. This is what they had convicted him. He was charged. He was sentenced to life in prison. But guess who releases him? Jonathan, the other criminal detective from the other jurisdiction now, the one that got into a whole fight. Why does he release him? Because in prison, he became a prison informant against bigger people. So Jonathan gets confronted by Benjamin. Oh, you know, Benjamin's pissed. So is Irene. Like, what are you talking about? This man committed such heinous crimes against women. He murdered a woman, he R-worded a woman, and you're using him as a police informant. He's literally on police payroll. That doesn't make any sense. And he says, I don't care what you have to say because I got the big boss's approval, so you can't say shit. And as they enter the elevator to leave Jonathan's new office, guess who they run into? Ian, who is in a suit and tie now, recognizes them, gets in, and makes a whole show of taking out his police-administered gun and, like, you know, showing them that it's full of bullets, taking out the magazine and showing it, cocking the gun. What? Like a whole shit show. So they're terrified. I mean, at this point, Irene says, there's no way that he's going to come after me, you know? I, I come from a prominent family. He would be an idiot. He would literally risk his freedom to come after me. He would never get away with it. But you, Benjamin... You just don't know that. So that same day, Pablo gets arrested. He was causing a scene. This is Benjamin's assistant, right? He was causing a scene at the bar. Uh, he called someone a Nazi. They get into a bar fight, yeah. And so it becomes like this whole thing. And Benjamin comes to pick him up, takes him home, and says, listen, what is going on? You're ruining your life. Your wife doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Your kids don't want to talk to you. You need to stop drinking. And he says, I know, I know, Benjamin. And Benjamin's like, listen, I'll, I'll talk to your wife for you. Goes to pick up his wife, and when he comes back home with Pablo's wife to pick up Pablo, right, from his place, the door is unlocked. And he walks inside. He tells Pablo's wife, just stay out here, but she doesn't listen. She comes in with him, and they find Pablo dead in the house. And the only thing that's been touched was a picture frame of Benjamin that has been folded down like this. A picture of Benjamin and Pablo, just folded down like this, I believe. That's really bizarre. Nothing else was taken, none of his police files, none of his, you know, work from home stuff, he's a detective. No files were taken, just a picture was folded down, and this will bother him forever. Now, he believes that Ian is the one that did this, so what does he do? He's gotta go tell Ricardo. So he meets up with Ricardo and tells him, he's out. I know that I promised life, 
And Ricardo's pissed. He says, you promised life. That's what you said. You said that he would serve life in prison and he got one year. What, what do you want me to do? Put four bullets in him? And then guess what? I'll get life in prison. And I, I, he'll, be, he'll still be free. He'll be dead or free. And I'll be envious. You promised life. And Benjamin, you know, what can he say to him? There's nothing that he can do. He just wants to tell Ricardo, at one point, maybe Ian will come for you. Like, just be careful. And they part ways. And then afterwards, Irene is telling Benjamin that they've got to run away together. Because Pablo's dead. Ian's going to come after the both of them. Definitely Benjamin. Maybe not Irene. But maybe they can start fresh in a new city. She's got family members. She has connections. They can get, they can get a new job. Let's just do that. But he says, no, you have to stay here because you're getting married and this is the job that you love. And he gets onto a train and they part their ways. So now we get a present time flashback to where Irene, old Irene with her husband and her children is reading this and she's like, I mean, I'm glad it's a work of fiction. It's a novel. So nothing's true in here. And he looks at her like, but isn't that what happened? Isn't that what happened? I left you at the train station and you were running for the train and waving at me and we cried. Isn't that what happened? And she said, well, if that's what happened, why didn't you take me with you? So it seems like both of them still have this love for each other, right? And he says, well, blah, 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 blah. Like, it just comes up with a freaking excuse. Get over it, dude. And she calls him a dumbass. And she just has one question. So what's the ending to this book? I mean, the book is like part of a love story with Benjamin and Irene and then the case. Ian gets away with it. I'm married and I have children. You were married multiple times. They all ended in divorce. That's a the ending. What kind of ending is that? That was the end of the book. Yeah. And okay. he says, yeah, I mean, that is kind of a ending. But maybe it's not. And he looks up the address to Ricardo just to see where he, what he's doing. How is he doing? How is he holding up? Maybe he can be the ending to the book. How do you get over the death of your loved one, the murder of your loved one? So he finds Ricardo's new address and it's like in the countryside, right? Drives all the way there by himself and Ricardo opens the door. It's been 25 years. Do you remember me? Of course I remember you, Benjamin. Come in. So he sits down and they start making some food, start making some tea, and Benjamin looks around and it's just filled with pictures of Liliana. He hasn't gotten over it. He still works at a bank, just a different location. That's what he does during the day. And now, you know, he never got remarried. He tried, he just couldn't get over Li Liliana. That was it. He gives him the manuscript and he reads it. And Ricardo likes it. He says, it's good, but I still think that you should just forget about it. It's been 25 years, which is a very odd thing to say when you saw pictures of your, you know, dead wife all over the place. Mm -hmm. and Benjamin's like, yeah, I know, but it's personal. They came from my friend. Yeah, I know. How do you know that? I just read it in the book. But you're not scared that they'll come for you, Ian? You're not scared that Ian's gonna come for you, Ricardo? He knows you, he knows that you were married to Liliana. You don't think he'll find you? No, I'm not scared of Ian. Um, tell me, Ben, did they ever find Ian? Nope, they haven't found him. He's still out there somewhere. And Ricardo says, see, all the bad guys always get away with it. And as they're about to leave, he says something. Ben Ooh. looks at Ricardo and says, you know what's weird? You know what's always bothered me? Is that Ian didn't kill Pablo because Ian knows what I looked like. So that means Ian probably sent people. He sent people. Pablo, you know, was home alone. They said, are you Benjamin? And he walked over and flipped my picture down. It's the only thing that was touched. And Pablo said, I am Benjamin. And he was murdered. Why would Pablo do that? Because Benjamin had a life ahead of him, you know? He wasn't getting drunk at the bars every day. Pablo sacrificed himself? Yeah. So that's how, like, that's how Benjamin knows that Ian is not the one who killed them. Ian had sent people to do the dirty work, like hitmen. And Pablo knew that these were hitmen, like right upon entering the house. They look like hitmen. They've got these big, you know, machine guns with them. And he said, yeah, I'm Benjamin. And they killed him. So it's personal. I'm not just going to forget about it. And Ricardo keeps saying, it's been 25 years. 
just forget about it. Move on. Just keep the memories, okay? That's all you have. Just move on. So Ricardo's about to leave, you know, he's telling them about how Ian had sent Hitman to kill Pablo. And he's like, how are you not scared? And Ricardo says, it's been 25 years, just forget it. I'm not scared of Ian, he hasn't come for me, he's not gonna come for me. And Ricardo looks at Ben and says, you know what? Come, sit down. You can stop looking. I knew that Ian was untouchable. I knew that, you know, there was no way that you could rearrest him. He had already served his time one year for what he did to my wife, for what he did to my Liliana. One year. And I knew eventually that he was going to come looking. So I snuck into my car one day. I um, drove to his place. And when he was coming out in the middle of the night, I shoved him into my trunk. I drugged him with chloroform shoved him into my trunk, drove near the trains where it was loud, and when the train passed, I opened up the trunk and I put four bullets in him, just like I said that I would at that cafe. Just like I said that I would, okay? So just drop it, he's gone. He's not coming for me, he's not coming for you. He's dead, he's dead now, so just forget it. Just go live your life, it's been 25 years, just freaking forget about it. And now you're wondering like, okay, well is Ben gonna rat him out? What's gonna happen? But Ben instead says, Okay, I just have one question. Was it worth it? And he says, just forget about it. My wife is dead, your friend is dead, Ian is dead, everybody is dead, okay? You keep thinking about it and then you, you're gonna start wondering, is there anything I could have done to prevent it? You're gonna live a thousand lives in the past, you're gonna have no future. I'm telling you as a friend, just forget about it, okay? And he just kicks him out of the house. So Benjamin starts driving and he starts having these flashbacks. All these thoughts keep rushing to him of how he promised, he promised Ricardo that he would give him life. And now Ricardo had to do this crazy thing of murdering someone else, which by the way, a lot of guilt if you're a good person, even if it was revenge, right? Like all of this guilt and of murdering Ian. I mean, what has this come to? And then he just stops the car and he gets out and runs back. He leaves the car there and runs back to Ricardo's place and starts hiding behind the trees, just watching him the rest of the day. And at night, Ricardo comes out of the main house with a tray of food. Maybe he's eating dinner. And he goes into the shed. And Benjamin gets up and starts working closer and closer to the shed. And he peers through and he sees it's a makeshift prison. There's prison bars. And he walks in and he sees that Ian is alive and he's being held prisoner and Ricardo is feeding him dinner and it's just silence and Ian comes up to the bars like trying to touch him like P -p please just I just have one favor can you at least have him talk to me wait wait, wait. Ian's talking to Benjamin also oh, Benjamin walked yeah. in straight up yeah just, just like that? straight up walked in and he's like, can you please at least have him talk to me? He won't even talk to me. Nobody talks to me. He won't even talk to me. And Benjamin looks at him and looks at Ricardo. And all Ricardo says, you promised me life. And Benjamin runs out and he rushes to Judge Irene's place. So you're thinking, oh my God, he's gonna rat him out. He's gonna rat out Ricardo. They're gonna save Ian because at the end of the day, you know, a cop has to be good or whatever, you know, like all of these things. The rules are the rules, justice, you know, the laws are the laws. And he rushes to Judge Irene's place and he says, that's it, just one life, that's all we get. And she says, it's gonna be complicated. I, I have a husband, I have kids now, that's okay. So instead of ratting out Ricardo, he decides that love prevails and he's got to ask out Judge Irene and they're gonna start dating finally. Ugh, and that's the end of this. Yeah, they're like in their 60s now. But you know what? Okay, steaming hot love in their 60s is steaming hot love in their 60s. And that's the end of the secret in their eyes. I mean, the question is, what would you have done? Wait, so are you sure it's not Okay, so these are the chronological order. So uh, Ian had someone come and kill Benjamin as revenge. He knew that he couldn't kill Judge Irene because she's super well connected. They made a point know, in that. How do you know it's not the husband? It's not the husband. He had a really good relationship with Benjamin. Mm. Like they had like this almost like he knew that Benjamin tried, you know? Like he didn't have resentment for Benjamin. He just had resentment for the law. I just hope that there's some sort of torture involved. 
You know what I mean? Because that would that would be a waste if there wasn't. That'd be a waste of breaking the law, Ricardo. Especially because this is fictional. I can say whatever I want. If this was a true crime, I'd say, you know what? Leave your opinion in the comments because I have none. Got none. But because it's fictional, I'm just saying. A little bit of torture here and there. Sprinkle in some spice to that asshole. Literally. And this whole BAM thing is going to be changing. We're going to have a weekly schedule. We're going to be posting the audio the day before the visuals. And the backdrop's going to be different. The content's going to be different. The baking's going to be... We're going to zhuzh it up. Just wait until we move. So stay tuned for all of that. Make sure to go follow Bacon and Murder on all podcast platforms or wherever you get your podcasts just so you can stay tuned. Make sure to check out helixsleep.com slash baking for the best sleep of your life. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.